Many of you watching this film have not been in your church for over five weeks because of the public health crisis. So for you, this will be a walk down memory lane which will welcome and make you look forward to the day we can return soon. For others of you who are watching our mass videos, you have not been here before, and so we thought you might like a look at the whole church rather than just the small part we're able to present on Sundays. Just inside the Park Avenue doors is the Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. This devotion began in Norfolk in England in 1061, when Our Lady appeared to the Lady Rochelles and asked her to build a replica of the Holy House of Nazareth. The shrine was visited by thousands of pilgrims from all over Europe for nearly 500 years. The shrine was despoiled and the statue burnt publicly in Chelsea by the evil Thomas Cromwell under orders from Henry VIII, who as the pilgrim hymn has it, had greed in his eyes and he lusted for treasure with fraud and with lies. Ironically, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon had been regular pilgrims praying for the gift of a son. Perhaps nothing else symbolized so poignantly the feeling of anguish in England at the break with the true faith it had always known as the destruction of the shrine. In 1921, a new parish priest went to Walsingham, Father Alfred Hope Patton, and re-established a shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham with an image he had carved from one found on a medieval medal in the British Museum. In 1931, the statue was solemnly translated to a separate chapel of its own, today's, today's Shrine Church. A worldwide cultus of Our Lady of Walsingham now thrives throughout the Anglican Communion, and a lamp burns for resurrection at Walsingham. The diploma of our shrine's affiliation with the Shrine of Walsingham hangs next to her with a hanging lamp and a framed set of prayers to be used by those visiting the shrine, especially those who have been pilgrims to Walsingham. By the west door is the shrine of St. Francis of Assisi. This Italian carved statue was given to the church by Mady Harper, a longtime parishioner in 2015. The statue was conserved, gilded, and polychromed by Center Art Studios of New York, and a new surround for it, designed by Father Swain, was made by Philip Forbes of Brooklyn, who had also made the surround for the Sacred Heart Shrine. The lasting appeal of this simple saint has been much felt in the last hundred years, and as the patron of animals, of children, the originator of the Christmas nativity scene, he is beloved of many. A votive candle stand is there for the faithful to light candles, and a pair of very fine 18th century Neapolitan gilt wood candlesticks adorn the shrine. If you look up, you will see guardian wolves, which remind us of the story of St. Francis and the Wolf of Gubbio. Alongside the shrine to our parish patron is the war shrine sacred to the memory of the war dead of the United States, the British Empire, France and their allies, in the Great War and the Second World War, with an additional memorial to American dead in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. The shrine is of St. George the Martyr, patron saint of warriors, who is depicted as an equestrian slaying the dragon. A pair of gilt wood candlesticks are alongside, and the statue was made for us in the Austrian Tyrol, and installed as the gift of the Guild of All Souls in 2018, as a memorial to the war dead everywhere, especially those who were members of the Guild in this country and in the British Empire. There are always two poppy wreaths there for remembrance, but in the ceremony on Remembrance Sunday, five or six more are laid by various members of the congregation, and until Christmas, the entire area is a sea of poppies. The font is original to the church, it is crafted of white calm marble, supported by four legs. Fonts are usually located in the west of a church near the door, to signify that baptism is the gate to the other six sacraments, as of course none of them may be received without becoming a member of the body of Christ in baptism as fir first. Ours is inscribed, except a man be born again, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. On the shelf behind the font there is always a crucifix and candles. The candlesticks are monumental silver gilt wood Italian ones, and the crucifix a sterling silver Belgian one, with an unusual twist in that it has figures of Our Lady and St. John attached alongside it. Next to the font is a font credence table, which came to us from the Church of the Holy Communion in Patterson, New Jersey, long a church of our tradition, which closed some years ago. We were happy to be able to give this polychromed and gilded wood piece a home, it is yet another piece by the talented artist Robbie Rollins. On such tables, during baptisms, are placed the requisite items, the bowl of Easter water, oil of the catechumens and sacred chrism, salt, 
the white garment, the baptismal candle, and the book needed for the ceremony. Near the font is the church's confessional. This one was made in France just after 1800, a common date as those destroyed in the revolution needed to be replaced after Napoleon made peace with the church, and it was brought here in 2007. It is made of French walnut. The left side is arranged for kneeling, the right side is a chair for those for whom kneeling would be difficult, and the center is the priest's part. Resurrection is privileged to have several relics of saints and holy objects. Three of the four altars have relics of martyrs deposited in the mensa, or altar stones, and some items from our large collection of antique and new reliquaries are normally adorning the altars. At the moment, there are a great many more than would be usual, as is customary in times of pestilence, plague, and war, to put out all a church's relics so that the faithful can pray to the saints for aid. Alas, no one can come in the church at present, but we feel that simply having the mountain around us bids their prayers. On the St. Michael altar uh, is another matter of such interest, il Bambinello di Napoli. These statues, often in wax and always dressed, are much in evidence in Naples as a result of a particularly virulent attack of the plague there in the mid-18th century. A young mother barely survived the plague herself, but then her two-year-old caught it himself. The anguished mother prayed to the baby Jesus to save him, and by tradition, he appeared to her as a child of the age of her afflicted child, and smiled and blessed the child who was miraculously healed. This statue was acquired along with other things which were our principal interest, but it suddenly acquired new meaning in early March, and we've put it out for the duration of the public health crisis. At the foot of the Epistle Isle, you will find the altar of St. Michael, which is used for some weekday masses. The altar has a neo-baroque sterling silver altar suite made for us in Toledo, Spain, given by Thomas Ray, who heard mass at that altar several times a week for many years. There is a shrine of St. Michael by the Lexington Avenue door, which is a 1920s neo-baroque hand-carved wood product of a famous studio in Venice, which has a green lamp hanging over it and votive candles for use. The pulpit is the original one placed in the church in 1869, as can be seen by the legend at its base. The pulpit was originally on the epistle side of the church, but was exchanged with the lady altar in 1950 by Father Chambers, so that the pulpit would be correctly on the gospel side since it is the gospel which we preach. The cornerstone is just behind the pulpit, having been placed in 1868, though probably moved here from its first place placement. The shrine of the Sacred Heart is next to the pulpit. This shrine was installed in 2004, blessed by the late Ralph, Father Ralph Walker, warden of the Guild of All Souls and master of the SSC in the Americas. And the statue of our Lord and sterling silver hanging lamp were created in Spain for this shrine. The carver of this unique bespoke work was an unknown artist in Avila, and as it is the policy of Granda Studios of Madrid that individual artists' names are never given out, all work being done to the glory of God, we will never know the name of this gifted artist. It is carved of olive wood and polychromed and gilded in the Spanish method called estofado, which means stew. This method involves gilding the entire statue with 24 karat gold leaf and then painting over that. This gives a very rich luster to the effect, and it also means that any gold you see is not added, but simply revealed by not being painted. The candlesticks are Spanish gilt wood of the 18th century, and this is the National Shrine of the Guild of All Souls, a devotional society of prayer for the dead, and the Guild's prayers are said here daily. It is also a popular shrine for those who have attended Mass in the Church or are just visiting. To the right of the high altar on the epistle side of the church is the shrine of Our Lady of Joy. The statue of Our Lady holding her child, both standing, was once at the center of the altar of Our Lady, formerly at the head of the aisle, and was given in memory of Edward Perkins, no relation to Francis Perkins, our famous parishioner. The candles burning before the shrine testify to Our Lady's regular clients here. The silver hearts are ex voto offerings made to European shrines of Our Lady over many years and have been given a home here. Others have been given since by parishioners. Our Lady of Joy and her divine child are both crowned. Ex voto offerings are made when prayers or favors are granted. Some are hearts returning love to God and Our Lady. Others are emblematic of the grace given. 
a pair of newlyweds and a dog among them. If anyone today wishes to offer one in Thanksgiving, new ones can easily be acquired. Large silver standard candlesticks from the famed silver workers in Toledo, Spain, adjoin the shrine. There's a bank of votive lights and a gorgeous English silver lamp with semi-precious stones acquired and hung there in 2017 in memory of William Latta. At the head of the Epistle Isle and next to this shrine is the All Saints Altar. This item was a traveling mass set used by Dominican friars in Peru and carved in about 1725. It is highly unusual to find an item like this in such good repair and with all its constituent pieces. When needed for a missionary visit, it would be loaded on a donkey cart and then make its way from one village to another, and a table would be pushed up to this to make a very impressive altarpiece. We have no idea how the parish came to acquire this extremely beautiful and unique item. There are photographs back to the 1940s which show it in the old rector's study. Clearly the donors must have hoped that it would be used in church someday, as giving such an elaborate and beautiful gift just to set it in office would make no sense. It was long assumed that it was in too bad condition to be restored, but in 2016 it was accidentally showed to the Center Art Studios who were here for another job altogether. It turned out that this area and period are a speciality of theirs and they were the most qualified entity in the country to restore this piece. St. Joseph was set away as a test piece and came back glowing and unbelievably beautiful. It was then that the vestry decided that this piece should be, that should be completely restored and placed in the church as our 150th anniversary project for 2018. The pair of candlesticks are Sicilian gilt wood from the 18th century. In addition to the doors of the altar piece, which close in Passion Tide, and displays St. Dominic and St. Rose of Lima, which suggests it was used by Dominican friars, there is an inside Calvary group and ledges with six charming statues of saints, one in each alcove, St. Joseph, St. John of God, St. John the Baptist, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Alexandria, and St. Anne with the Virgin Mary as a child. The Latin American decorations of the piece, including the arabesques, are very characteristic of the melange of Arabic, Spanish, and native Latin American cultures. This piece was clearly created out of both great love and great artistic talent, and we are extremely fortunate to have it here. Perhaps the most moving thing is that the back of the body of Christ, which can never have been seen by anybody other than those who handled and removed the figure, is fully carved and polychromed with his bloody wounds. It is a source of great pride for us finally to have had it restored and returned to its original use. The retablo was 150 years old when this church was built, and the church is now 150 years old, which creates a nice circle of 300 years since Mass was first said before this altarpiece to the time that it now is again. The crucifix is an antique made of ebony, tortoiseshell, and ivory inlay, and completes the altar. The 1916 Casa Van Orpen, Opus 665, has been fully restored and augmented. This beautiful, lush, French-style symphonic organ was given new life, having been removed from St. Peter's Basilica in Lewiston, Maine, and entirely restored, updated, and given lovely appropriate additions in 2009 by the Organ Clearinghouse. We have an extensive and beautiful music program organ music, orchestral concerts, and approximately 60 choral mass settings offered each year. The choir is often considered among the best professional choirs in New York. In the case of pipes above the console, we have recently added two new statues, one on the left of King David playing his lyre, often considered a patron of church music, and on the right, St. Ambrose of Milan, the first Christian hymn writer. A magnificent paschal candle, also by Robbins, stands here at the gospel horn of the altar during the 40 days of Easter. This enormous stand befits the importance of the paschal candle and Eastertide itself. The polychrome holy oil albury was installed during the tenure of Father Bourne between 1920 and 1935 and was originally used as an albury for the Blessed Sacrament. Father Wadhams, his successor, installed the proper tabernacle on the altar, 
and with that the ombre was converted to its correct use for the storage of the three holy oils used in the sacred liturgy, oil of the catechumens, oil of the sick, and sacred chrism. Hence the painted legend on the outside, O.S., meaning Olea Sancta. It is the product of the Robert Robbins Studio of New York, which we have mentioned earlier. Mr. Robbins, an artist living in Greenwich Village, did a great deal of work in Anglo-Catholic churches all up and down the East Coast. Walking into the church, you will see at once the stone altar, high above the nave floor, unchanged since the beginning. Above it is a carved stone gabled canopy supported by two rose marble columns, each surmounted by a stone angel. The sculptured Briridos depicts in deep relief one of the most moving scenes of the New Testament, St. Mary Magdalene's meeting with the risen Christ outside the Holy Sepulchre. The subject was chosen as the original dedication of the church, which until 1907 was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The moment chosen is the exact one when St. Mary Magdalene, thinking our Lord was the gardener, hears him speak her name, and with that knows that he has risen as he said. The Baroque silver big six candlesticks are French and flank the tabernacle with its veil in the color of the day or season. There are normally various reliquaries on the altar, and also a set of Baroque altar cards, and a crown tops the tabernacle, which acts to keep the veils in place. The very elaborate gold Baroque credence table is the right. Banners are often placed in the church at festive seasons, and among them you will notice the spectacular banner of the resurrection, with this highly embroidered gray silk, a product of the famous studio of Cernanian Compa. It was designed by him in the 1920s and produced by the Sisters of Bethany and their workrooms in London, and was sold to us for the then spectacular sum of 62 pounds, five shillings, threepence halfpenny, or something like 12,000 pounds, or $16,000 today. A splendid funeral pole and set of requiem vestments were provided from the same source at the same time. The Hanging Rood, a thank offering for the fifth anniversary of Father Gordon Wadham's rectorate in 1940, was the work of Dutch sculptor Joop Nichols, then living as a refugee from the Nazis in this country. He had been a member of the Dutch resistance and left his country just hours before its fall to the Germans. The window over the high altar was then plastered in as it was thought to detract from the rood and its Victorian style was not in favor. The lovely rood has recently been cleaned and relighted. A major stained glass project was executed in 2014 and blessed by Bishop Alan Shin at Michaelmas that year. 21 windows were installed in all, including those at eye level on three walls of the church and one at the top of the Park Avenue stairs. The scheme begins by the pulpit with the Annunciation and then follows the life of our Lord around the church, ending with the resurrection. Two other windows depict saints who are patrons of special aspects of our life, St. Nicholas, the patron of children and of New York, and St. Cecilia of church music. The windows were designed by Father Swain and made by master craftsman Nick Perendo of Hunt Stained Glass Studios of Pittsburgh. Mr. Perendo died in February 2016, shortly after executing this large commission, which was his last. Perhaps suitably for a building dedicated to the Holy Sepulchre and the Resurrection, the church and parish had been many times reckoned to be at the point of death. In the first decade of the 20th century, in 1920, in 1949, and again in 1992, and the building was nearly sold in 1940 for a move to what is now Park Avenue Christian Church, Nonetheless, each time it has risen from the dead and remained what it has always been, the house of God and the gate of heaven, the home of the seven sacraments on this block, and a haven of prayer and recollection. Today, continuing our way forward with new initiatives and we hope new insights, we are nonetheless absolutely committed to traditional liturgy and worship and the best of traditional music of the Western Catholic tradition. We have now been worshiping in this church building for 152 years. Certainly none of those original parishioners would even recognize this neighborhood, which has become one of the most expensive and desirable in the world, but they would recognize their church. Perhaps too, the early Tractarian parishioners might be slightly surprised at some of our feast days and ceremonies, but they would recognize the same desire to pursue holiness and to worship God. They might well be pleased to see how far their movement and ideals have come. There is no place else in our lives more important 
and we are grateful to have shared it with you today. If you are seeing this video online, we hope you may visit one day, and if you have visited, we look forward to seeing you again. It has now been my honor and privilege to be rector and parish priest of this church now for longer than anyone other than the Father Founder, and I am most thankful for what we have been able to achieve together with this church building since 2001.